From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Cube. We are still getting through COVID. It's a hot August day here at the San Francisco Bay Area. I think it's 99, somebody said in the city, that's hot. But we're still getting through it. We're still reaching out to the community. We're still talking to leaders in, in all the areas that we cover. And one of the really interesting areas is natural language processing. And you know, it's just a small kind of subset. We'll get into it a little bit more in detail, but a very specific uh, place within the applied AI world. And one of my very good friends and CUBE alumni, who's really an expert in the space, he's coming back for his second startup in the space. And we're joined uh, by Ben. He's Ben Chung, the co-founder uh, of Ogmagod. Did I get that right, Ben? Ogmagod. That's correct. That's right. Great to see you again. Thank you for inviting me to the show. Well, I love it. You know, one of the topics that we've been covering a lot, Ben, is is um, applied AI. Because, you know, there's just so much kind of conversation about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning as kind of this global big thing. And it kind of reminds me of, of kind of big data or cloud. In, in the generic, it's interesting, but it's really not that interesting because that's really not where it gets applied, where I think what's much more interesting and why I wanted to have you back on is, you know, where is it actually being applied in applications or where are we seeing it in solutions and where is it actually changing people's lives, changing people's days, changing people's behavior. And you seem to have a propensity for this stuff. Uh, it was five years ago, I looked, July, five years ago we had you on and you had founded Genie, which was a natural language right. processing uh, company focused on scheduling. Uh, successful exit, sold that to Microsoft. I think they baked it into who knows, they probably have it baked in all over the place. Left there, now you've done it again. So before we get into it, what, what's so intriguing to you about natural language processing for all the different kind of opportunities that you might go after from an AI perspective? What is, what's special about this realm that, uh, that keeps drawing you back? Yeah, sure, yeah, I mean, it. To be honest, it was not anything premeditated. It, I kind of stumbled on it. I before this, I was more like an infrastructure guy. Spent number of years at VMware and ha had a blast there and learned a lot. Um, then I kind of just stumbled on it because uh, when we started doing the startup, uh, we didn't intend it to be a AI startup or anything like that. We just had a problem that uh, my co-founder Charles Lee and I really wanted to solve, which is to help people solve people's scheduling problem. But very shortly after getting into it and start looking at some of the use cases, we thought that the easiest way is to communicate with people like humans do to help them do the scheduling. And that's kind of how I stumbled on it. And it wasn't until that I stumbled on it that I realized that it has a lot of traction to me because I throughout my whole life, I always, uh, I'm always very interested in uh, the human emotions of it, how humans relate to each other. And that's always been a hidden side project thing. I do traveling to figure out those stuff and get a little bit of that. But once I start getting into this field, I realized that there's a lot about it, about humanity and how humans communicate, that it was kind of like a hidden interest for me um, that now suddenly coming out and it kind of just got me hooked. Right, that's awesome. So one of the things, um, and we'll just get into it is, is um, you know people are a little bit familiar with natural language processing probably from from Siri and from Google and from Alexa and increasingly some of these tools. But I think you know you kind of rapidly find out beyond what's the weather and play a song and you know tell me a joke that that the functionality is is relatively limited. So when people think about natural language and they have that as a reference point, how do you help them see that it's a lot more than you know, asking Siri for the weather. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, capability, but also hopefully not, not offensive to some of the tech visionaries. Just as a guy who's dealing with it every day, there are also lots of limitation. It's not nearly to the degree of refinement, like what we what might be preached out there, saying that the machines are going to you know take over everything in one day. We we have a lot of struggles with very basic stuff with machines. However, there has been definitely a lot of breakthrough in the last few years, and that's why I'm, I'm dedicating my life and my time into this area because I think that it just, you know, there's going to be a huge amount of innovation continuously going right. uh, in this area. So that's at the high level, but if you talk about um, 
you know, in terms of artificial intelligence and in general, I think I I have my own understanding. I'm more like an apply guy, rather than academic. So uh, what I'm going to say might make some academics cringe because I'm more like an everyday practical guy and try to reconciliate these concepts myself. The way that I view it is that artificial intelligence is really try to help mimic some human capabilities that originally thought that it's is the domain of human. Only humans are able to do it, but machines now try to demonstrate that machine can do it, like you know, as though the humans could. So, and then usually people get that mixed up with machine learning. To me, it's actually quite a different thing. Artificial intelligence is like what I mentioned. Machine learning is a, just a a technique or or a, a a science or way of applying like to to leverage this capability, machine learning capability in solving these artificial problems, artificial intelligent problems to make it more achievable, to raise the bar on it. So they, I, I don't think we should use them interchangeably, artificial intelligence and machine learning, because today machine learning is the big deal that, that are making the progress for us. Tomorrow, it might be something else to help improve the artificial intelligence. And in the past, it was something else before machine learning. So it, it's a progression. And machine learning is the uh, very powerful and popular technique right now to being used. Right, right. Now, within artificial intelligence, I think you mentioned that there are various different uh, domains and topics. There is like uh, object recognition, used with image processing. There's speech detection. There's a video and uh, video, uh, what I would call action or situation detection. And then there's natural language processing, which is the domain that I'm in that is really in that stage of where we seeing quite a bit of breakthrough, but it's not quite there yet. You know, whereas versus speech uh, detection and image processing actually has done a tremendous progress in the past. So, and, and you could say that like the innovation there is not as obvious or as leapfrogging as the natural language processing. Right, so, so some of the other examples that we know about that, that are shared often uh, uh, for machine learning are say, you know, the, the visual thing, you know, can you, mm -hmm. you identify a chihuahua from the blueberry muffin, which sounds kind of funny until you see the pictures, they actually look very, very similar. And, and the, you know, it's mm -hmm. always stated that, you know, Google in their Google Photos, right, has so many pictures, such a huge and diverse data set in which to train the machines to identify uh, a chihuahua versus a, um, a blueberry muffin. Or you take the case in Tesla, if you've watched any of their autonomous vehicle stuff and, and their computer vision, process and they have the fleet, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of cars that are recording across many, many cameras reporting back every night. With natural language processing, you don't have that kind of a data set. So when you think about training the machine to the way that I speak, which is different than the way you speak and the little nuances, even if we're trying to say the same thing, I would imagine that the, uh, the, the, the variety in the data set is so much higher and the quantity of the data set is so much lower that that's got to be a, a, a kind of special machine learning challenge. Yes, it is. Um, I think it, it, the, I think if people say that there is, uh, we are at the cusp of, you know, being able to understand uh, language in general, I, I don't believe that we're very far away from that. And even if when you narrow scope to say, like focus on one, one single language like English, even within that, we're still very far from it. So I think the reality, at least for me, speaking from the ground level uh, kind of person, try to make use of these uh, capabilities is that you really have to narrow it to a very narrow domain to focus on and, and, bound, and bound it. And my previous startup is really that, you know, that our, um, our assistant to help you schedule meetings, uh, that assistant doesn't understand anything else other than scheduling. We, we only able to train it to really focus on uh, doing scheduling. If you try to ask it about a joke or ask anything else, it wouldn't be able to understand that. So um, I think the reality on the ground, at least from what I see uh, of a practical application and being successful at it, you really need to like have a very narrow domain in which you apply, uh, de de uh, apply these capabilities. And then in terms of technology being used um, broadly in natural language processing, I, in my view, there are two parts of it. One is the, the input, which people sometimes call natural language understanding. And then that part has actually very good progress. 
And then the other part is the uh, the natural language generation, meaning that the machine knows how to compose uh, sentences and generate back to you. That is still very, very early days. So so there is that breakup. And then if you go further, I don't want to bore you, Jeff, here with all these uh, different nuances. But when you look at natural language understanding, there are a lot of areas like uh, what we call topic extraction or entity extraction, event extraction. Uh, so that so extract the right things and understand those things from the sentences. There is sentimental analysis, knowing that whether some a sentence expressed is somebody's angry or or some different kinds of emotions. There is summarization, meaning that I can take sets of text or paragraphs of text and summarize it, you know, with fewer words for you. So, and then there is like uh, dialogue management, which manages the dialogue with the person. So there are like these various different fields within it. So the deeper you look, there's like more stuff within it and there's more challenges. So it's not like a blanket statement say like, hey, we we can conquer all this. And if you're digging deep, we, there's some good progress in certain these areas, but some areas like, you know, it's really just getting started. Right. Well, we talked about in in, uh, in getting ready for this call and kind of reviewing some of the the high level concepts of. And you brought up, you know, what is the vocab? So first, you have to just learn what is the vocabulary, which a lot of people probably think it stops there. But really, then, what is the meaning mm -hmm. of the vocabulary? But even more important is the intent, right? Which is all driven by mm -hmm. the context. And so, you know, mm -hmm. the complexity beyond vocabulary. Um, is is super high and extremely nuanced. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you start to approach uh, algorithmic algorithmically? Excuse me, um, to start to call out these things like intent or I mean, pe people talk about sentiment all the time. That's kind of an old marketing thing. But when you're when you're talking mm -hmm. about specific detail to drive a conversation, and you're also oh by the way converting it back and forth between voice and text to run the algorithms in a text-based system, I assume, inside the computer, not a voice system. How do you start to, 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 to identify and programmatically define intent and context? Yeah, um, just to share a little anecdote, like one of the most interesting part of, uh, since I started this journey six years ago, and also interesting, also very frustrating part is that, uh, especially when I was doing the uh, scheduling system, is that, how sloppy people are with their communication and how little that they say they communicate to you and expect you to understand. And when we were doing the scheduling assistant, we were constantly challenged by somebody telling us certain things. And we look at it, it's like, well, what do they mean exactly? You know, uh, you know for example, like uh, one of the simple things that we used to talk a lot with new people coming on the team about is that when people say, uh, they want to schedule it next week. They don't necessarily mean next week. What they mean is not this week. <laughs> so it, it doesn't, you, if you like take it literally and you, you say, oh, sorry, Jeff, there is no time available next week. And actually Jeff probably not even remember that he told you to schedule it next week. He, what he remembered what he told you not to schedule it this week. So when you come back to them and say, Jeff, you have nothing available this week, next week. And Jeff might say like, well, your assistant is kind of dumb. I'd like, why are you asking me this question? Uh, if there's nothing available next week, just schedule it the week after next week. But the problem is that you literally said next week. So if we took you literally, you know, we would um, cause unhappiness for you. But we kind of have to guess like what exactly you mean. Right. So they're like, this is a good example where there are like a lot of sloppiness and a lot of um, contextual things that we have to take into account when we communicate with humans or you know, when we try to understand what they say. So, so yeah, it's exactly your point. It's not like uh, mathematics. It's not simple logic. There are a lot of it things to it. So the way that I look at it, there are really two parts of it. There's the science part, and then there's the art part to it. Right, right. The science part is like what people normally talk about, and I mentioned earlier. You have to narrow your domain to a very no narrow domain because you cannot. You don't have the luxury of collecting infinite data set like Google does. You as a startup or you any team within a corporation, you cannot expect to have that kind of data set that Google or Microsoft or Facebook has. So you, without that data set, huge data set, so you want to deliver something with a smaller data set, so you have to narrow your domain. So that's one of the science part. The other part is I think people talk about all the time to be very disciplined about 
data collection and creating training data sets so that you have a, a very clean and good training data set. So these two are very important on the, on the science part, and that's expected. But I think a lot of people don't realize is what I would call the art part of it. It's really there are two parts to that. One is exactly like what you said, Jeff, is to, to narrow your domain or make some assumption within the domain so that you can make some guesses about the context because the user is not giving it to you verbally or giving you to you in the text. A lot of us, we find out visually by looking at the person as we communicate with them. Or even harder, we have some kind of empathetic uh, understanding or situation understanding, meaning that there is some knowledge that we know that Jeff is in this situation, therefore I understand what he's saying right now means this. Or that Jeff is a tech guy like me, therefore he's saying certain thing, I have the empathetic uh, understanding that he meant this as a tech guy. So those are the, that's a really art kind of part of it to capture or make some good guesses about um, the context. So that's one part. The other part is that you can only guess so much uh, so you have to really design the user experience. You have to be very careful how you design the user experience to hide what you don't know so that it's not frustrating to the user or to put guardrails in place such that the user doesn't go out of bound and start going to the place where you are not trained for, that you don't have to understand it. Right, right. Because it's so interesting, because we talked about that before, that so much of communication, it, it's not hard to, to know that communication is really hard. Email's horrible. We have a hard time as, as humans, unless we're looking at each other and pick up all these nonverbal cues that add additional context. And am I being heard? Am I being understood? Does this person seem to understand what I'm trying to say? Is it not getting in? I mean, there's so many of these kind of nonverbal cues as, you, as you've expressed that really support the communication of ideas beyond simply the words in which we in which we speak. So, you know, so and then the other thing you got to worry about too, as you said, ultimately it's user experience. If the user experience sucks, uh, for instance, if you're just super slow because you're not ready to make some guesses on context and it just takes for a long time, people are not going to not going to use the thing. So, I'm I'm curious on the the presentation of the results, right? Lots of different ways that that could happen lots of different ways to screw it up, but how do you do it in such a way that it's actually adding value to some specific task um, or job? And maybe this is a good segue to talk about what you're doing now at uh, Ugma God. I'm sorry, I have to look again. I, got, I haven't memorized that one yet. <laughs> um, so, so how do you, I think you, because what you're also doing, if I, if I recall, is you're taking now an additional group of data uh, and additional data sets in beyond simply this conversational flow but ultimately you've got to suck it in. As you said, you've got to do the analysis on it, but at the end of the day, it's really about effective presentation of that data in a way that people can do something with it. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing now beyond uh, scheduling in the old days. Sure, yeah. I, um, I left Microsoft uh, late last year and started a new startup. Uh, it's called Oak My God. And what we do is to help salespeople to be more effective, understand the customer better so that they have higher probability of winning the deal or to be able to shorten the sales cycle. Uh, and oftentimes a lot of uh, the sales cycle got lengthened is because of the lack of understanding. And there's also, as a we focus on B2B sales. So for B2B salespeople, uh, the world has really changed around a lot since the internet came about. In the old days, it's really about tell it, to explain what your product is and so that your customer understand your product. But the new days is really about uh, not explaining your product because the customer can find out everything about your product um, you know, by looking at your website or maybe your marketing people did such a good job that already communicated to the customer exactly what your product does. Uh, so, but you to really to win out against other people, you really like almost like a consultant to go to your customer and say like, I have done your job, almost like I've done your job before, I know about your company and let me try to help you to fix this problem and our product fit in as part of that, but our focus is let's fix this problem. So how would you be able to talk like that? Like, like you've done this job before, like you worked at this company before. How do you get at the level of information that you can present yourself that way to the customer and differentiate yourself against all the other people who try to get their attention? All the other people send them them email every day automatically. How do you differentiate that? So. We felt that the way that you do it is really have the depth of understanding with your customer 
that is unrivaled by anybody else. Now, sure, you can do that. You can Google your customer all day, read all the news report, know all the leadership, follow them on social media. Right, they're supposed to be doing all this stuff, right, Ben? They're supposed to be doing all this stuff. And with Google and the it. internet, yes. there's no excuse anymore. It's like, how did you not do your homework? They used to, you used to have to get the, the yellow Yeah, pages. why didn't you do your homework? Yeah. Yes, yeah, some people get beat up by their management saying like, oh, how come you missed this? It's right there, go on Google. But the truth is that you have to be empathetic to a salesperson. A lot of people don't realize that for a salesperson, every salesperson, you might own 300 accounts in your territory. And a lot of times, you, you know, you, in terms of companies, there might be thousands of companies in your territory. Are you going to spend seven hours, follow all these 300 companies and read all the tweets, you know, check out the thousands of employees in each of these companies, their LinkedIn profiles, look at their job listings, you know, look at all the news articles. It's impossible to do as a human, as a person. If you do that, you'll be sitting in your computer all day and you never even get to the, get in the door to have a conversation with the customer. So that is the challenge. So like I felt like uh, salespeople really put up with the impossible task because all this information out there, you expect it to know. And if you screwed up because you didn't check, then it's your fault. But then on the same time, how can they check all 300 accounts and be on top of everything? So what we thought is that like, hey, we made a lot of progress on natural language processing and natural language understanding. And salespeople, what they look for, it's a quite narrow domain. They are not, you know, they, they're looking for some very specific thing related to what they sell it. And very specific projects, pain points, budgets um, related to what they're selling. So it's a very narrow domain. We felt like it's not super narrow. It's a little bit broader than I would say scheduling, but it's still very narrow, the kind of things that they're looking for. They're looking for those buying triggers. They, so they're looking for problem statements within the customers that relate to what they're selling. So we think that we can use, uh, develop a bunch of machine learning models and use the, what's available in terms of the web, uh, you know, what's out there on the web, the type of information out there. And to be able to say like, salesperson, you don't need to go and keep up and scan uh, you know, all the tweets and all the news and everything else uh, for these 300 companies that you cover, we'll scan all of them. We will put them into our machine learning pipeline and filter out all the junk because there are lots of junk out there. Like Nike does like, I don't know, hundreds of news release probably per week. And most of them are not relevant to you. It doesn't make sense for you to read all of those. So, but how about we read all of them? <laughs> and we extract out, you know, we ex this is called topic extraction. We extract out the topic that you're looking for, and then we organize it and present to you. Yeah, not just we extracting out the topic. Once we get the topic, how about we look up all the people that are related to that topic in that company uh, for you so that you can call on them. So you know what you want to talk to them about, which is this topic or this pain point, and you know who to talk to. These are the people. So that's net net what we, what we do. That's, you know, that's really interesting. It was, it's been a tagline around here for a long time, right? Separating the signal from the noise. And, and I think what you mm -hmm. have identified, right, is, is as you said, now we live in the age where all the information is out there. In fact, there's, there's too much information. So, uh, you know, you, sh you should be able to find what you're looking for, but to your point, there's too much. So how do you find the filter? How do you find the trusted um, kind of conduit for information so that you're not just simply overwhelmed? Now what you're talking about, if I hear you right, is you're actually querying publicly available data for particular types of, I imagine, phrases, keywords, sentences, digital transformation initiative, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then basically then coalescing the ecosystem around that particular data point. And then how do you then present that back to the salesperson who's trying to figure out what he's going to work on today? B2B salespeople, they, it, they start with an opportunity. So the opportunity is actually a very concrete word, at least in, in the tech, in the yeah. tech B2B well, we know. sales. We see the, uh, it's the a, uh, 60 stories in downtown San Francisco will validate that state. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, yeah, so it starts with, uh, with the word opportunity. So the out output is a set of potential opportunities. Okay. So it speaks to the salesperson's language and say, when you use us, we don't just say, hey, Jeff, there's this news article about Trulio, since you cover Trulio, that's interesting to you. Oh, there's a guy that, you know, at Trulio that matches what you, the kind of persona that you sell into. We don't start, we don't start with that. We, we start with Jeff, there are six opportunities for you. 
opportunities for you at Trilio. Let's explain what those things are. And then it, let's explain the people behind these opportunities so that you can start qualifying them. So, so get you started right away in your vocabulary in, in a package that you understand. Uh, so that I think that's what what differentiates us. Right, right. And at some point in time, would you would you you know potentially just thinking logically down the road, you know, have some type of Salesforce API so it just pumps into whatever their existing system is yeah. that they're that they're working every day, and then it describes based on the algorithm why the system identified this opportunity, what the attributes are that flagged it, who are the right people, etc. Awesome. So, what yes. kind of data you, you are, designing, are, are you you're designing our product for us? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon as Dave and John watch this, they're going to want to talk to you, I'm sure. But um, what what type of data sets are are you are you querying? There are lots of them. Uh, we learn most of it by through the process of working for salespeople. Meaning that we work for salespeople, we maybe you know quote unquote stand there behind their back and see what they're searching. They're searching LinkedIn. They're searching jobs. They're searching analysts, uh, you know, uh, call transcripts. Uh, they're looking at 10K, 10Qs. They, they, they dig up various, some people are very, very creative, digging out various parts of the web and find really good information. The challenge is that they can't do this to scale. They can't do it for 300 accounts because for doing it one, for one account is very laborious. So there, there are various different uh, places that we can find information uh, and and i just uh, and it's not the in terms of the pattern that we're looking for it's not just keywords it's really concepts we call it a topic we're really looking for very specific topics that the salesperson looks for and that's not just a a word because sometimes words is very misleading for example i tell you one of the common words in tech is called jenkins jenkins is a very po popular technology uh, uh, continuous delivery uh, technology stack. But Jenkins is also happens to be a very common last name for people. Hmm. Well, so. I'm, 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 always, I'm always reminded of our Intel days with, with uh, all, all the acronyms, but my favorite is ASP, because you could use ASP twice in the same sentence and, and, and mean two different things, right? Average, average selling price yeah. or application service provider back in the days before we called them clouds but you know yes. the, the the nuance the nuance is so tricky so within kind of what you're doing then and and as you described you know working within defined data sets and keeping the UX um, and user experience pretty dialed in and within the rails are there particular types of opportunities um, in terms of b2b types of, of opportunities that fit better that have kind of a, a richer data set a higher uh, efficacy in in the returns. What what are you kind of seeing in terms of you know great opportunities for you guys? I so f you know we're still early, so I can't tell you that like from a global view because we we are like less than one year old of experience, quite honestly. So, but so far, you know, we are being led by the customer. So, meaning that there is an interesting customer, they ask us uh, to look for certain topics or certain things. And we always find it, to my surprise, because, uh, and that really is a, uh, like I'm constantly surprised by how much is there out in the web, like what you were saying. You know, like customer ask us to look for some things and uh, I thought for sure uh, this thing, uh, we couldn't do it, we can't find it. And we gave it a try and lo and behold, there it is, it's right. out there. So um, to be honest, I, I can't tell you at this point because I have not run into any limits. Right. Uh, but that is because we are still a very young startup and we are not like Google, we're not trying to be all encompassing, looking for everything and looking over everything. Uh, we're just looking over everything that a salesperson wants. Right, right. That, that's it. So I'm going to make you, I'm going to make you jump up a couple levels um, since you've been thinking about this and, and working on this for a long time. You know, there's a lot of conversation about machines taking everybody's jobs. Um, then there's the whole, you know, kind of side tranche to that, which is no, it's all about helping people do better jobs and helping people do more um, higher value work and less drudgery. I mean, that sounds so consistent with what you're talking about. I wonder, as somebody down in the weeds of artificial intelligence, if you can kind of you know, tell us your, your your vision, you know, of how this is going to unfold over the next several years. Is it just going to be many, many, many little applications that slowly, before we know it, are going to have moved, you know, along many fronts very far? Or uh, do you still see, you know, it's such a fundamental 
human thing in terms of the communication that you know the, these machines will get better at learning but ultimately you know they can kind of fulfill this promise of taking care of the drudgery and freeing up the people to make what are hard, actually much harder decisions from a, a, a computer's point of view than maybe the things that we think about that a three-year-old could ascertain with, with very little extra effort. Yeah, um, you know, if you take a look at what we do, and hopefully it didn't sound like um, we're uh, underselling our startup, but um, a lot of it really is we're taking away the time consumer and also grunt work process of the data collection and, and cleaning up the data. The humans, the real human intelligence should be focused on data analysis, you know, to be able to derive lots of insights out of the data. So, and to be able to formulate a strategy, how to win the account, how to win the deal. That's what the human intelligence should be focused on. The other part, like struggling with doing the Google search and it returned 300 entries in 30 different pages and you have to click through each one and then give up after the first three. You know, that kind of data collection, data hunting work, we are really, you know, should not, I don't think it's worthy, quite honestly, uh, for a very educated person to deal with. Uh, and we can invest it back in, you know, helping the human to do what, it's, what the humans are really good at, is that how do I talk to Jeff and I'm going to get a deal out of Jeff? You know, how, how can I help and do helping him solving his problem? How can I take the burden of solving the problem from Jeff's head and solve that problem for him. That's what human intelligence, for me as a salesperson, I would prefer to do that instead of sitting in front of my desk and doing Googling. Right. right. So, so what, so net net, what I'm trying to say using our sales as an example is that we're not taking over the job of a salesperson. You know, there's no way that we can close a deal for you. Um, but what we're doing is that we're empowering you so that you, look like you're on top of 300 accounts and you talk to pick any of those accounts you'll be able to talk to the people your customer that particular customer like you know them inside out right and you know and, and without you being that superhuman that uh, to be able to do all this stuff but as far as that customer is concerned sounds like you were on top of all this stuff all day and that's all you do you have no other customers they're the only customer in fact you were on top of 300 customers so that's kind of the value that we see uh, to provide to the human is to, you know, to be, uh, allow you to scale by removing these grunt work that are preventing you from scaling or living up to your potential of how you wanted to present yourself, how you wanted to deliver yourself. Right. Well, that's a great There's addition. no way that we can be smarter than the human, no way. Well, I just don't see it, not in my lifetime. <laughs> I just love, you know, we've had a lot of conversations over the years and, and you talking about the difficulty in training you know, the computers on, on some really nuanced kind of human-y things versus the things that they're very, very good at. And, you know, keeping the keeping the AI in the right guardrail is probably just as as important as keeping, you know, the, the user interface in the, uh, in the right lane as well to make sure that it's a mutually beneficial exchange and one doesn't go off and completely miss the benefit to the other. Well, Ben, it's, it's a great story, um, really exciting place to, uh, to dedicate yourself and, we are just digging, watching the story, and, and we're going to enjoy watching this one unfold. So thanks for taking a few minutes and, and sharing your insight on natural language processing and this applied machine learning techniques. Thank you, Jeff. It's always a pleasure. Yep. All right. He's Ben. I'm Jeff. You're watching theCUBE. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.